listening to In the Weeds Prohibition Talk Radio on WGDR 91.1 and WGDH 91.7. This is Joseph Smith of In the Weeds Prohibition Talk Radio with your local and national canon news for June 24, 2019. Federal agency urges marijuana businesses to submit CBD comments to the FDA. An office of the Federal Small Business Administration, SBA, is encouraging cannabis businesses to submit comments to the Food and Drug Administration regarding the risk and benefits of cannabis products. In a notice published this month, SBA's Office of Advocacy noted that the 2018 Farm Bill federally legalized hemp and its derivatives while the FDA retains its authority to regulate such products. It is also highlighted in a public comment period concerning CBD regulations. The deadline for which was extended this week to July 16th due to the interest among stakeholders. The update comes as the House Small Business Committee is increasingly looking to SBA policies related to cannabis. The panel met on Wednesday to discuss opportunities and obstacles for small cannabis businesses under the federal framework of prohibition. During that hearing, members spent a significant amount of time addressing how access to SBA resources such as low-interest loans could benefit entrepreneurs in the space. While SBA revised its policy earlier this year to clarify that hemp businesses can access such loans, those that deal directly or indirectly with cannabis are ineligible. A point of contention for lawmakers who are pressing that the agency open up benefits to more cannabis firms. SBA's recent interest in the cannabis industry can also be tracked to a separate congressional hearing that took place last month when Senator Jackie Rosen pressed SBA's acting chief counsel of the Office of Advocacy on whether existing federal regulations are inhibiting the growth of state legal cannabis markets. Congress votes to block feds from enforcing cannabis laws in legal states. The House of Representatives approved a far-reaching measure on Thursday to prevent the Department of Justice from interfering with state marijuana laws, including those allowing recreational use, cultivation, and sales. The amendment, which also shields cannabis laws in Washington, D.C. and U.S. territories, is now attached to a large-scale appropriations bill to fund parts of the federal government for the fiscal year 2020. The inclusion of adult use programs represents a significant expansion of an existing policy that protects only local medical cannabis laws from federal intervention, which was first enacted in 2014 and has since been extended through the annual spending bills. The broader rider was approved in a floor vote of 267 to 165, a tie that is considered by legalization supporters to be an indication of how much support there is in Congress for more comprehensive and permanent changes to federal marijuana policies. This is the most significant vote on marijuana policy reform that the House of Representatives has ever taken, said normal political director Justin Striegel. Today's action by Congress highlights the growing power of the cannabis law reform movement and the increasing awareness by political leaders that the policy of prohibition and criminalization has failed. The fate of the cannabis measures in the Senate is unknown for now. Historically, that Chamber's Appropriations Committee has been relatively open to attaching marijuana riders to the spending bills and has consistently approved the cannabis protections. But the body's Republican leadership may be reluctant to take further steps of also trying the Justice Department's hands when it comes to enforcing federal prohibition against licensed businesses and consumers in the states that allow recreational cannabis use and sales. House passes amendments stripping DEA funding and pushing FDA to regulate CBD. Two drug policy amendments cleared the House of Representatives on Thursday, building on reform victories in the chamber the day before. Two drug policy amendments cleared the House of Representatives on Thursday, building on reform victories in the chamber the day before. One measure addresses funding for the Drug Enforcement Administration and the other would direct the Food and Drug Administration to establish regulations for adding CBD to foods and dietary supplements. 
The first amendment, introduced by Republican Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, would transfer $5 million from the DEA to an opioid treatment program. It passed without opposition on a boys' vote and is now to be attached to the House version of a large-scale spending bill. But it remains to be seen how the Senate will set funding levels for the agency in its own version of the funding legislation. The DEA is still receiving $2.36 billion in funding, which is $90 million higher than what was appropriated for the last fiscal year. It is also about $78 million higher than President Trump's requested in his budget. Representative Robert Aderholt claimed time designation for the opposition on the floor but said he supports the amendment. The congressman did note, however, that, that funding for opioid abuse prevention grants has increased by 360% since 2017 and that we want to work with both sides to make sure we have the appropriate funds necessary to make sure we fight this opioid addiction that has taken over so many parts of this country. The amendment's description directs FDA to undertake a process to make lawful a safe level for conventional foods and dietary supplements containing cannabidiol CBD, so long as its products are compliant with all other FDA rules and regulations. Columbia Court ruling public cannabis use is legal. According to an LA Weekly report, Columbia's Constitutional Court has ruled parts of the president's 2017 police code are unconstitutional, including the ban on public cannabis consumption. The rule effectively legalized public cannabis use on the South American nation. The rule effectively legalizes public cannabis use in the South American nation. Cannabis and other illicit drugs were decriminalized in Colombia seven years ago, and medical cannabis use was made legal three years ago. But recreational cannabis is still outlawed. Under the medical cannabis law, Colombians can grow up to 20 plants, but there is otherwise not a legal consumer market. Senator Gustavo Boliviar indicated that the ruling was based on technical legislative errors, rather than the desire to change a 2017 law. In 1994, the nation's constitutional court ruled that punishing drug use violates the right to privacy, an individual's autonomy, and the free development of personality which are guaranteed under Article 22 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. President Duque said while he accepts and respects the court's ruling, the free determination of personality is not above free determination of drug addiction. He adds that the police would continue imposing penalties and confiscating cannabis even if the doses are considered legal for personal use. The Columbia legislature convenes today and reports indicate that many expect the body to tackle legalization legislation. Minnesota hemp farmer facing charges for high THC content. The Twin Cities Pioneer Press reports that the Minnesota hemp farmer who is suing the state over a cease and desist order has been charged with two felonies and one gross misdemeanor after his seized crops tested 10 times higher for THC than the legal limits for hemp. Louis Hummel, owner of Fifth Sun Gardens, is charged with drug sale and two counts of drug possession in Fillmore County. The criminal charges stem from a traffic stop during which a county sheriff's deputy seized hemp-derived products from the driver who indicated they were from Hummel's Farm. According to the criminal complaint outlined by the Pioneer Press, the driver told the deputy that the products were illegal. The complaint also alleges that Hummel told authorities that he tries to make his hemp products more like cannabis products to entice the buyer, and that THC levels in his hemp products go up when they are concentrated. Hemmel received a cease and desist letter on May 1st informing him that he was being removed from the state's industrial hemp pilot program and his license had been revoked for a year. The letter also ordered him to destroy his entire crop. Hummel contended that the individual stock was not charged with possession and the letter was premature because the products had not violated tests for high levels of THC. Paul Johnson, president of the Minnesota Hemp Farmers and Manufacturers Association, said that Hummel's crop had tested within the 0.3% threshold for hemp when it was evaluated by state regulators. And he said the case underscores the need for more specific regulations regarding hemp production, noting that THC levels often rise up when hemp is concentrated. Campbell's lawsuit against the state argues that the cease and desist in order to destroy the crop violated his due process rights. Hummel had estimated his business is worth $3.5 million. Oregon is now the first state that can export weed. Since weed is still federally outlawed, state-legal cannabis companies can't ship cannabis products across state lines. 
but that may soon change if an Oregon export program can clear two more bureaucratic hurdles, one of which requires the federal government to greenlight the program. On Thursday, Oregon's Governor Kate Brown signed SB 582, informally known as the Weed Export Bill. The bill allows Oregon cannabis companies to transport weed to other U.S. states that also have a legal cannabis program. To legally export weed, partner states must first consent to import Oregon shipments, meaning the other states must pass similar bills or ordinances to accept the Beaver State's weed. The second hurdle may prove trickier. It requires the federal government to also give its blessing to weed import exports either through stature, meaning the passage of new federal law, or through tolerance meaning the Department of Justice issues a memo saying that, yeah, it's cool to ship that weed, and no, the feds will not use their resources to interfere. Congressman withdraws veterans' marijuana measure amid VA opposition. Representative Earl Blumenauer withdrew an amendment on Friday that would have allowed U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs doctors to recommend medical marijuana to patients in states where it is legal. The congressman whose separate measure blocking the Justice Department from intervening in the state legal campus activities passed on the House floor on Thursday. He cited high rates of opioid prescriptions and overdose deaths among veterans as one reason he is repeatedly advanced this amendment. In 2016, versions of the measure cleared both the House and Senate, but the language stripped out by Republican leadership. This time around, the VA stood against the measure. The specific concern apparently is that the VA doctors could potentially be prosecuted for aiding and abetting violations of the Controlled Substances Act by filling out forms on a federal property to help veterans obtain cannabis, which is still a Schedule One drug. Blumenauer had filed a separate amendment on the issue blocking the Justice Department from punishing VA physicians for that activity, but also withdrew that measure earlier in the week prior to the Rules Committee consideration because it would have been ruled not in order. Advocates have pointed out that the federal courts have already determined that the doctors who simply recommend medical cannabis to their patients are protected under the First Amendment. But the VA's concern caused uncertainty among lawmakers as to whether that protection extends to federally employed physicians. And those questions have jeopardized the amendment's passage on the floor. It's not just Blumenauer's measure that VA is resistant. A department representative testified in opposition to four pieces of legislation focused on cannabis and veterans that were discussed during the Congressional Committee hearing on Thursday, including Blumenhauer's standalone bill to accomplish the same objective as his appropriations amendment. The official told the panel that the VA is also against legislation that would require the department to conduct clinical trials on therapeutic benefits of cannabis for conditions such as post-traumatic stress disorder and chronic pain a bill that would mandate a survey of veterans on their cannabis use and proposal to require training on medical cannabis for VA health practitioners. All that said, it is possible that if the congressman would have moved ahead with this amendment and the VA effectively made its case to defeat the measure, that could have jeopardized this related bill, which would permanently codify the policy as opposed to being attached to an annual funding bill that needs to be renewed as is the case with the amendment. Considering how the standalone legislation received a hearing this week and seems positioned to advance further, a failed vote on the amendment could have risked politically damaging the bill's prospects. Maine Legislature Approves Recreational Marijuana Rules The Maine Legislature approved amended rules for the adult use marijuana sales and oversight just hours before it broke for summer recess Thursday morning. The rules, which are required by law, now go to the governor's desk. Among other things, the amended rules ease the requirements on certain foods contained in cannabis and on the state's residency requirements for creating a recreational cannabis business. With the governor's stamp, they would also go into effect 90 days after the legislature adjourned. That's almost three years after Maine voters approved recreational cannabis retail sales. The amended rules delete wording that might have limited out-of-state ownership of companies involved in recreational cannabis. The rule changes represented a major step forward for the Wellness Connection of Maine, the largest medical cannabis dispensary in the state, which has plans to expand into the recreational market. The Maine Senate approved the rules on a vote of 26-9. to The Maine House approved them without a roll call. The rules also amend the Maine food law so foods contain adult-use cannabis are not considered adultered if they are prepared in a licensed food establishment that is also a licensed adult-use cannabis products manufacturing facility. Another rule amendment authorizes 
the Maine Department of Administrative and Financial Services, which oversees the Office of Cannabis Policy, to check to see if conditionally licensed applicants continues to meet the requirements for conditional licensure. If not, the department can refuse to issue an active license. And this is Joseph Smith, and that's it for your local and national Canada News for June 24th, 2019. All right. Good morning, everybody. You are tuned into WGDR Plainfield, WGDH Hardwick. This is Gar College Community Radio with Joe Smith and Brandon Barbario. Uh, and also, we have Timothy Fair in the line, guys. Uh, stay tuned for today's show. We do have Keith Morris coming in from Willow Crossing Farm. Uh, everyone's running a little bit behind today, so we're going to start off with Tim today, which is what we don't normally do, but he's here. Tim, how you doing? Hey. Good morning, Joe. Doing well. Good, good, man. Um, Beautiful Monday. All right, the summer is cruising, man. <laughs> it is cruising. <laughs> so we're almost we're almost to July, right? We got July Fourth coming up. We got a lot of things going on. Uh, but this last week was a very interesting week in the news, as we all know. Um, one of the biggest things was Congress votes to block the feds from enforcing marijuana laws in legal states. So um, that being said, what would that mean for all of our all of our states being protected from federal? Well, so first of all, it was the House of Representatives that voted on that, which is huge. Don't get me wrong. That uh, is the first and uh, farthest we've seen anything get through the House of Representatives up until this session. Uh, uh, no pun intended, but the old uh, chair of the Rules Committee, Pete Sessions, not related to Jeff, but uh, he was the one that held everything up. Now that the Democrats took it back over, this is the farthest we've seen. The new uh, chair of the Rules Committee is a Democrat who let this come to a vote, and as we fully expected, had any of the previous uh, measures gone to vote, it did pass uh, rather uh, strongly. <laughs> so uh, now the question is going to be, will the Senate incorporate that into the spending bill as well? Uh, that's still kind of an open question, but I think when you saw the bipartisan effort in the House, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on the Senate to get this through. What this does, however, and people need to understand, this is not a new law. This is a rider on a spending bill, so it's a part of the overall budget spending bill. There's been a similar provision. It was a originally known as the rohrbacher Bloomhauer Amendment, then it became the rohrbacher Farr Amendment, then it became the Farr Amendment, uh, which has protected medical programs. And this has been passed by both the uh, House and the Senate and been added into these spending bills. Uh, this, however, rider would be a similar fashion. It would need to be renewed every year, but it would grant the same protections to the medical programs in the states as uh you know, to adult use, uh, which is huge. Uh, you know, obviously we have not seen any enforcement actions from the federal government against any of the adult use programs uh, in the country right now, which is 11 states. Uh, but the possibility always existed. Assuming this rider does get attached and does get through the Senate as well, uh, that's going to enshrine those protections uh, in the same way as the medical program. So it's a very, very exciting time. Uh, it's a huge step. Uh, it's not we haven't won. Uh, we won't win until the federal government changes the laws completely. Uh, but it is a huge step, and I think a lot of people are very rightly excited about it. It is a great step. Progress. Time. Progress, finally, right? Definitely progress. <laughs> but, but now, so we, so we have progress on this level, right? But then I see an article about how um, the VA, the, uh, the bill that was being pushed through, is now being yeah. pulled back a little bit. Do you know what's going on with this? Again, you know, this is that back and forth, the give and take that uh, is unfortunately a part of any legislation and a legislatively enacted laws. Uh, there's always going to be people on both sides. So the original provision would also have not penalized VA doctors for recommending medical cannabis. Uh, that, however, is stalling a little bit. There is some blowback against it. Uh, there are people saying, well, if you recommend cannabis, then maybe they won't go and take pharmaceuticals, and that could really help them, blah, blah, blah. I think we all know that's a bunch of uh, crap. But at the same time, that is the argument on the other side. So uh, we don't feel quite as strongly as that particular provision uh, will make it through. We certainly hope it will. We're keeping our fingers crossed. Uh, but this really gets mm -hmm. into the issues with still having cannabis uh, as a Schedule One controlled substance. At the end of the day, as ridiculous as we all know that is, uh, no medical value, give me a break. Uh, but because that is right. still technically federal law, there's a strong argument on the other side saying we're not going to allow the VA to recommend a Schedule One controlled substance. Um, it's absurd, but... Right. That's kind of where we're at with that. 
It seems like we take a step forward in one area and take two steps back in another area, which is just, it's 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 well, look at Massachusetts now, banning CBD edibles. You can buy THC edibles, but you can't get CBD edibles. <laughs> Don't take care. And you right. know, it doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense. And you're right. It's one step forward, two steps back. But, uh, you know, this coming from the federal government is a huge step forward. And assuming this gets passed and we can keep our fingers crossed that it will, uh, that's really going to uh, really spur further. Uh, development further change uh, once those protections are enshrined in the spending bill then uh, you know the advocates can start moving towards the next step right all right so i mean there's a lot of things going on and you brought up the massachusetts thing like this you know uh, maine, maine tried to do this a couple what, a couple months ago and then they after a couple of weeks they they quickly reversed their decision there um do you think massachusetts is going to stick to this or is this something that you know we could look forward to hopefully getting a reversal or, or is this something to push the fda to clarify some of these some of these rules um well what happened in maine was the department of health was the department which came out uh, originally uh, banning the cbd edibles in which the legislature immediately turned around and passed a law protecting them so that's where you have kind of this uh back and forth between uh, different agencies within the government. You have the legislative branch and the legislature, obviously, versus the health department, which is an executive uh, level department. Now, this uh, guidance in Massachusetts did come from the health department as well, their health and human services department. However, uh, getting anything legislatively passed in Massachusetts is a lot more difficult than Maine. So are we going to see the legislature actually take some action uh, like we saw in Maine? Uh, that's a good question. I, I hope so. Um, I have a feeling, unfortunately, however, that it's really going to be now uh, the ball's going to be back on the FDA uh, to make some changes, which we are, of course, seeing also a lot of pressure, a lot of political pressure and a lot of momentum on the FDA to get these changes uh, made, uh, whether it's uh, classifying CBD as a food supplement, which would put it under a much less regulatory uh, oversight, or if it's the FDA pushing back to Congress to have a federal law passed uh, allowing uh, CBD, which could also be a possibility, uh, and I just my sneaking suspicion is that we're not going to see a lot of movement in Massachusetts, uh, at least officially, until the FDA makes its changes. But the question really becomes, what is the enforcement going to be like? Obviously, if you've been to Massachusetts lately, uh, much like Vermont, there's CBD everywhere. There's CBD in uh, gas stations. There's CBD in convenience stores. There's CBD in health food stores. There's CBD in uh, coffee shops. Uh, you know, is the state going to crack down? Are they going to go in and start seizing? these products? Are they going to, you know, I mean, what is this enforcement, and I put quotes around that, going to look like? And that's going to be a huge question. They may very well just take the position uh, that it's not allowed, but yet not make any real serious moves to enforce it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. if they do, you know, again, I really hesitate to see what that could possibly look like. Are they going to send thousands of inspectors out, seizing people's products in stores all over the state? And then where are they going to put them? <laughs> you know, so I think there's still a lot of unanswered questions. It's going to be interesting. I mean, if we go by, like, a little bit of pass, right, because of what happened in Arizona when concentrates became illegal, okay, it wasn't that they definitely weren't taking those measures. And that was really, I mean, that's high THC value. You know what I mean? Right. So, I agree. I mean, with the CBD measure, it's just it's a joke. It really is. They're going to continue to sell it. You know, people are going to continue to buy it. Um, thankfully, with the whole Arizona ruling, the judge did rule that concentrates are legal. Oh, that was so that, that was incredible. Legal. Right. I mean, literally, it's been taken off the map. It's just interesting to see these states that have <laughs> open open consumption. Uh, you know, we have. States are, are looking to export weed to other legal states, which what does that mean for laws? I mean, if one state can export to legal states that are allowed to accept their exports, wouldn't that other state want to export something back out to, you think? I mean... Well well, you're talking about Oregon right now and the law that they just uh, signed that would allow that. However, they need to find another state that would allow that as well. So it would have to be a back and forth between two legal states. And that's still in pretty direct violation of not only federal law, uh, but of uh, the original 
uh, bullet points in the call memo. Uh, this would be interstate shipment. Yeah. This would be diversion. Again, air quotes around that uh, term, um, which could really potentially have the blowback of a U.S. attorney trying to prosecute. Uh, is that going to happen? Again, I don't know. Uh, I'm very curious to see how this develops. Just because a state says we can do something doesn't mean they're going to actually move forward with doing that thing. Uh, I know there have been several lawsuits from states like Oklahoma uh, about the diversion coming from legalized states. None of them have gotten very far, uh, but this would be the type of thing that could potentially cause uh, prohibitionists to really uh, lose uh, yeah. <laughs> lose their minds. No. Um, my quick, well, we'll have to think. It's interesting. Now, my quick question is on that. Like, all right, so we just discussed that, right? So, if if we're going to have exportation between two states um, that are accepting to do this, right? Um, obviously, there there is still some federal oversight here. Uh, but Thursday, the House of Representatives um, they approved a far-reaching measure that would allow or or would block the the feds from interfering with states that are currently legal. Um, right. Is that does that look like something that's going to happen? Uh, that does. That, I, I do believe that's going to pass. Mm -hmm. I do believe those protections will go into the spending bill. Uh, I do believe that's going to happen. But the problem with talking about interstate transport now is you are exceeding what, you know, you have to remember, as far as the mm -hmm. federal government is concerned, for their uh, measure of legality, considering it's illegal on the federal level, they are still looking at those coal memo uh, points. And diversion out of state is definitely one of the no-nos, uh, according to the right. coal memo. So. Uh, you know, and the question is, even if those protections are enshrined, would shipping cannabis from, say, Oregon to, I don't know, let's say Illinois, which is recently now uh, going to be legal as of January, uh, would that be allowed? Um, you know, we're seeing hemp shipments. Look at what happened in Idaho and Oklahoma getting uh, stopped and busted. Can you imagine some Idaho state trooper actually pulling over uh, a couple thousand pounds of high-test THC? Uh, you know, I, that's, that's a real... Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're throwing people in jail for hemp. God only knows what they... You know, I mean, you would be probably looking at a life sentence for that poor truck driver. Uh, so how, you know, how do you actually ship that cannabis? How do you get it from point A to point B? Maybe if you're going... For from Oregon to Washington State or a border state, that wouldn't be as big a deal. But if you're going right. anywhere uh, across a state which doesn't have a legal program, you've got a serious, serious problem with transportation. Well, also, I don't believe that there'll be any mailing or flying or rail or any other means of transportation at this point which would allow that. So just because you get the law stating, yes, we uh, as a state say we can do this, that doesn't mean it's a done deal. There's still a lot of logistics that would need to be figured out. Right. I mean, there's, there's a lot going on right now. I mean, a lot. And everything, Every day. and everything seems to be leaning on something else because as we talk about, you know, transport, now we're talking about, you know, the, D, the DEA blocking, you know, or trying to block the federal government from interfering with legal states. And then now, you know, the House is passing an amendment stripping the DEA funding and they're pushing the FDA to regulate the CBD, which is what we talked about before. But I mean, even looking at the numbers, it seems like the DEA is just being overfunded at this point and they're just spending billions of dollars where it, they're they're not supposed to be, right? I, I <laughs> that's, that's kind of going out on a limb. You know, I, do I think the DEA is overfunded? Absolutely. Do I think we need to stop these raids on cannabis? Absolutely. But at the same time, yeah. You know, I don't know the breakdowns because we do have an opiate problem. We do have a methamphetamine problem. This is where, you know, these type yeah. of uh, things, the synthetic marijuana, which I hate that term because it's not marijuana, this spice and these K2 that are actually causing some serious harm and killing people. If you've got a substance that's causing, you know, people to die or causing people to get massively sick, that is an issue. That is where the DEA should be focusing its attention, and they should have a budget to do so. Uh, however, going after cannabis, going after CBD, going after this is just a... I mean, come on, give me a break. You know, it's a low-hanging fruit. It's easy. Uh, most of the times, you know, officers' lives are not going to be at risk when they're dealing with a cannabis issue. Um, and so and it's great for funding. That needs to be, you know, stricken. But, uh, you know, it's hard for me to say for sure whether the DEA has too much money. I just know that they're whatever they do have, they're putting it in the wrong damn direction. <laughs> right. I mean, and then, then the last thing real quick before we have to go – for the top of the hour, um, I just I read an article last night that really kind of 
made me laugh because as, as we sit here in Vermont and we talk about Champlain Valley Dispensary and and all the all their scenarios in the news, I read about a Minnesota hemp farm who's facing charges oh, for high guy. THC content. Right, uh, he's face he's facing two felonies um, after his crops were seized uh, for testing ten times higher. Um, than the uh, what's allowed by law. Um, well, let's get that straight. Three percent THC. Three percent THC. Yeah, Still three. not anywhere near enough to get anybody, right. you know, high. Anything, right. Uh, three yeah. percent, and that was after uh, plants were harvested, oil was extracted, and put into products. Which obviously there is a concentration that occurs after mm-hmm. extraction. Now, should that have been fractionally distilled? Sure, maybe. Did he make a little mistake? But we're not talking about 21% THC. We're not talking about 20% THC. We're not talking about adult use products being, you know, hidden in hemp uh, like happened here in Vermont. We're talking about 3%, which, uh, you know, should, <laughs> is not psychoactive. <laughs> right. So, I mean, we're seeing this everywhere, guys. Uh, I mean, it's like we said, in some states, things are just getting swept under the rug, like here in Vermont with Champlain Valley Dispensary, who's processing these things and, 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 and doing this stuff. Uh, but that's going to straight out. They are illegally growing cannabis on <laughs> unsuspecting business property. I, you know, I, I hate how everyone just kind of pussyfoots around this. Champlain Valley Dispensary committed a major felony. Uh, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. There's no question about it. And the state has chosen to do absolutely nothing about it. Which is ridiculous. I mean, it's just, when we see everything going on everywhere else, it's ridiculous. And then, you know, Hmm. and and, and poor Pia Peach Greens, and, you know, just creates this, this, these are the problems that we need to face here. And uh, and it definitely shows where the state stands on uh, who they support and who they do not support when we got a guy going to jail for a plant over his plant count medicinally um and yet these guys can do that but anyways we gotta get to the top of the hour break guys you are tuned into wgdr plainfield wgdh hardwick this is in the weeds prohibition talk radio with joseph smith brandon barbario and one of our great friends and fellow colleagues timothy fair of vermont cannabis solutions guys don't go anywhere we'll be right back that funky breeze in the weeds hey young america we need to talk you may think this is uncool you may even think it is bogus but i want to tell you about something that has everyone buzzing Something that concerns mature boys and girls just like you. Something called grass. Not that grass. I'm talking about marijuana. You may have heard of it. You may have seen someone smoking it, like those burnout bohemians or that crazy-eyed custodian at your school. You may have taken a toke or two. But do you know the whole story? Do you know the blunt truth? Gunja, Joint, Doobie, Do, Chronic, Ace, Lobo, Loco, Love Boat, Bud, Buddha, Blunt, Pot, Pat, Pin, Chiba, Chiba, 420, and Hashish, or Hash for short. No matter what you call it, no matter what hip street lift it's referred or referred to by, it all comes from the same stash. It's all marijuana. I know what you're thinking. What is marijuana? What makes marijuana so dangerous? Where can I get some marijuana? Well, brother, I'm not going to nickel and dime you. I'm not like the man all you kids are rebelling against. I'm hip. I know what young people are dealing with these days. In fact, here are some of my free-thinking friends to prove how completely not square I really am. Parents are hypocrites. They tell us one thing, but then they do another. Why don't they practice what they preach? Adults never have time to listen to us. And when they do, they just don't think what we're saying. Why can't we dress the way we want in school? So what about grass? Let's start with the basics. Marijuana is a plant that grows best with plenty of water and sunlight. Its leaves extend outwards in a star pattern some say resembles a hand. An open palm reaching out to claim its next victim. 
rolled in zigzags or popped from seventh period woodshop projects, the smoke from this plant causes a brief state of euphoria, immediately followed by permanent insanity. Users are prone to unpredictable behavior, including junk food binges, joyride, and a sudden urge to wear sunglasses at night. Plus, they look flat out crazy. You there, stop laughing. Laughing is a symptom caused by blowing pot. Take a good look at yourself. Are you addicted? Are your eyes half shut and bloodshot? Do you recognize that person in the mirror? Then blame it all on marijuana. Long-term use of marijuana can lead to a psychological dependency. Soon, you'll be taking all sorts of measures to get your fix. People will start calling you names like Pothead or Smokey McBongwater. Losing all motivation, it's likely that you'll drop out of school, take a sudden liking to sitar music, and maybe even get felt up by a cop or two. So why smoke grass? I took it on a dare. And if I dared you to jump off a cliff, would you do that too? Man, everybody blows pot. Uh-uh. I know this one guy that doesn't. Wait, not that guy. This guy. Oh, no, thank you. Not for me. Well, I'm not for you. It has to spike creativity. No, it doesn't. Look at these paintings. The artist was stoned when he painted these. Those don't look like real flowers. Is marijuana really where it's at? Is it really as righteous as you think? There is more to life than grass. There are fulfilling careers and the Ruby Beach Party. The closer you look, the more seeds you find in your stash. Follow your hopes and dreams. Be someone. Do yourself and your country a favor. Don't let this happen to you. All right, guys, we are back in the studio. Uh, we do have Keith Morris here from Willow Crossing Farm. Hey, can you hear everything, Keith? Are you all set? Hey, pleasure to be here. Thanks. All right. Let's get you on. Uh, is Tim still there, Tim? Oh. You still there, Tim? Yep, I'm still here, Joe. Hey, Keith. Hey, <laughs> Howdy. <laughs> so, oh, we have quite the uh, the show for you guys today. Uh, Tim, I want to say thank you. Uh, again, a lot of great news. A lot of crazy things happening this week. Um, but the biggest thing right now is I just want to let everybody know that the um, the Small Business Association is asking people to comment about the FDA, uh, to the FDA about uh, CBD and things like that. You have until, was it, July, I believe, 16th of this month to do so. Um, so, guys, reach out. Make sure you reach out to the uh, the Food and Drug Administration um, and talk to them about your CBD and if you're a business and anything like that that are going to be struck by this, now's your chance. Um, Tim, again, thank you for everything, as always. Um, Absolutely, Joe. You have uh, you guys have a great week, and uh, we'll talk uh, next week. All right, we'll talk to you soon, buddy. Hi. Cool. Bye. Uh, bye. All right, guys. Now we're back. Hopefully, we get we get the show rolling now. <laughs> it's been we're, we're all late today, so uh, it's, an, it's a typical summer Monday, right? Um, long weekend. First it was Monday great. Monday out of school, right? Kids are here. Yeah. Did you get the kids here? Yeah. All right, man. That's awesome. Puppeteers over there. Awesome, awesome, right. awesome. Um, so, Keith Morris, we've had you on the show before. Um, you are well known in Vermont, man. You are well respected, well known, and well loved here. Um, lots of credit to you. Uh, Willow Crossing Farm has been an amazing hive, it seems like, for Vermont cannabis. I mean, we started off with the legalization party there on July 1st, right? Yeah, um, yeah and- it's really interesting. I mean, you know, at the moment, I'm called to remember, like, hiking in with an anklet and <laughs> having, like, the first phone line actually ever drive to Willow Crossing came from my house arrest and um, it's just really interesting, you know, to root there um, deeply. And that's, you know, I, what I hope we all do in our communities and our ecologies is, like, you know, find home. And mm. even 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 as we move around, you know, wherever, because I still don't even live full time at that farm. It's really interesting. At that time, actually, during house arrest was the only time I lived by enforcement. <laughs> I right. spent a winter, you know, out there on the on the on the floodplain on a pretty wild place, which which is what we love about it, too. You know, we try to foster wildlife and bring wildlife from the ecosystem in combination with the wildlife of of humanity Mm. that you know we find ourselves and find each other and heal both right so 
Well, I mean, now, now it is now Willow Crossing Farm is technically one of the oldest permaculture farms in Vermont. Is yeah, that? I mean, you know, they're probably um, you know the remnants of permaculture that was practiced almost ten thousand years ago is 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 everywhere here, right? So that's a hard thing to say, actually. Um, but you know, we look even just driving down the, the river valley, like you see the nut trees stretched up, you know, as far as anybody could reach their canoe, like mm. for you know, thousands of years. So I think it's hard to, you know, it's whether we're using that name or not. It's sort of, you know, uh, uh, imprecise. Right. So. Now, you I mean, you're doing more than than this. I mean, we know you from the industry for, for hemp, right? Like, you've been an activist for over 20 years. I mean, you've been a strong figure in the hemp game in Vermont and all over. Um, but Willow Crossing does more than just hemp, correct? Yeah, I mean, we're, uh, you know, a fruit tree, nut tree, berry bush, vine, uh, medicinal herb, farm and nursery i mean really it's just a wild plant collection where you know i go nuts i grow nuts um, <laughs> we have a lot of nuts on this year it's incredible mast on the hybrid nuts that, yeah. are, that are interesting and you know just trying to you know if you go and look at the aerial photographs you can see it was a bare hay field um not that long ago you know and mm. really just recognizing ecological secession as something that's happening anyway uh, i'm kind of diving in with it instead of you know usually we're fighting it right we're trying mm. to like cut back the brush and like put it in our gardens and in this case, it was it was bare and exposed and eroding floodplain hayfield that was mowed right over the edges of these crumbling banks, you know. Mm-hmm. And we've just you know been planting like tens of thousands of trees, and and still even then, like you know, nature has outdone us by orders of magnitude with its own suckering and seeding mm-hmm. over essentially twenty years of, of my management. So. So, not, so I mean, not to change the subject, but nuts, man. I mean, I never realized nuts grow prevalently in, in Vermont. Yeah, we but grow uh, three dozen species of nuts: um, hazelnuts, walnuts, chestnuts, heart nuts, um, pine nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and play with other more experimental nuts too. Cool. Um, yeah. Nice. So, I mean, but uh, Will Crossing Farm is just more than just a farm as well, right? You do a bunch of educational, like really intense educational series up there um, through Prospect Rock Permaculture, right? Yeah, so Prospect Rock Permaculture is an organization that started there at the Will Crossing Farm, which essentially built the permaculture programs for Yes Tomorrow, Sterling, UVM, St. Mike's, Paul Smith's. So really we're trying to look at how we bring... Um, farm design and ecology into into one place and, and bring in practice. We've been you know hosting residential courses, which is really fun because we bring all these different minds to share totally different ways of how this vision plays out. Uh, actually, end of this month we're having a two week you know farm design course, and that's really the, the centerpiece of what we're trying to do is have people think big picture about how natural building and site design, and which direction the wind blows and sun, you know, and and really anybody growing cannabis at any scale from balcony to broad acre hemp uh, should be thinking about these farm design ideas right because mm-hmm. even even what you're doing in your closet isn't you're creating an ecosystem um granted you have control of the water and light which is really interesting but you know you know in, in the floor under my cannabis i have uh, pineapples you know mm-hmm. what i mean and they just they don't take up any room and they love it and you just take the tops of like off you cut the you pick the right pineapple at the store and you took the cut and they grow really easy they have all these roots and, you know, you stick it between the pots and you've got, you know, a polycultural uh, set up. Right. So, you know. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, you know, even with cannabis, uh, you know, we, we discuss a lot on the show, like, the soils, the makeups, like, you know, growing indoors versus outdoors, natural sun versus how do we collect a source that's like that, whether it's HPS lights, halides, or even LEDs now, right? Yeah. Um, and now we've mm-hmm. seen the big push of... Which is great. Like I talk about this all the time. Cause it's like 80 years ago, everybody was growing in soil, right? Outside in soil, they didn't care. It was just soil. And then it went to this huge advancement towards nutrients and and yeah, I'm a big fan. Away of from in soil. soil, right? Yeah. But now it seems like we're going back to like super soils and live soils. And, and well, we know of that we can't nature. recreate it, right? We, right? we might have the ability to have more control, right. um, but we cannot recreate this infinitely. You know, mostly not understood. Mm-hmm. And that's and I think that's where the parallel comes in cannabis and in our in our cannabinoids. You know the CBD game is um, interesting right now. It's you know it's, we're taking one little piece and we're essentially mo- modeling the pharmaceutical industry and saying like, well, how do we isolate? Yeah. And that's that's not what we love cannabis for, and that's not what medicinal herbs are. Mm-hmm. And that's and that's where we're going right. wrong. That's where we've gone wrong with cacao. That's or cocoa and mm-hmm. and, th- and that and coca. And that's where we've gone wrong with um, poppy plants. Is we took the one thing that mm-hmm. we thought we needed only. And take it out of context, mm-hmm. and take it out of its cultural context, and we wonder why people are so. In the case of of the poppy plant, 
sick and dying, mm-hmm. right? Um, but nobody's sick and dying from opium. And I don't mean to say that doesn't have potentially problematic, you know, yeah. whatever. But, and so I think when we're, and really what we're seeing is the commodification of medicinal cannabis. We're seeing this transition to who's the biggest field crop grower can get the lowest pi- p- price per kilogram. Um, and we're losing control and we're losing transparency and we're losing intimacy and we're losing connection. And I really think anybody that uses CBD or any cannabis in any way mm-hmm. um, knows their grower, knows the strains. It's really important. You're buying CBD in a bottle. If it doesn't say, like, the the indica dominant or sativa <laughs> dominant or, you know, like what really are, you know, and all these different strains are just as nuanced. And frankly, in the case of CBD, way more wild. Mm-hmm. It's a joke to think we have mm-hmm. these stable that, you know... <laughs> Um, yeah, we see them. If you really test, like plant by plant, it's um, <laughs> not right. No, <laughs> which is fun, right? We're yeah. opening new doors, and that's why, like the CBG and the CBN and all these other things are like we need entourage. We what? know that isolation means inferior medicine. So why are we giving yep. that to people? B- because it's legal, quote, right. air quotes. You know. Well, that, that's that's a question. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, you know, we, we're talking about CBD everywhere, right? In, in all sorts of, of food, beverages, stuff like that. Most of these things are being made with isolates and distillates and, and things that are extracted quickly, cheaply, and like you said, yeah. the, the cheapest price per liter. So right. what's the quality on that, right? Um, and then second of all, though, um, everybody's relying on the CBD thing. Like you said, it's like the hottest thing in the market right now, um, hotter than you know the biggest song on the radio. Um, but... It's, that's not the whole story, right? I mean, we talk to doctors all the time, and we talk about the entourage effect, and we talk about CBN and all, you know, THCA and all these other, other additional beneficial uh, cannabinoids, which, I mean, there's there's hundreds of them, right? Um, so why so why are we narrowing it down to one? Like you said, we're building a whole medical a whole medical empire based off of one compound. Yeah, it's um, really interesting, and it's, you know, it's, um, it's... Yeah, it's, it's scary. It's really scary. We're watching uh, we're watching the corporate co- takeover of cannabis unfold, and, we're, and essentially how they imagine it'll play with THC being a similarly extracted mm-hmm. and isolated rather than, yeah. you know. So, you know, know your grower, know your medicine, learn how to make the stuff you like. And I'm not saying there isn't a beauty also of mm-hmm. this isolation. It's kind of nice to be like, wow, CBD is this mm-hmm. component of the high end of the body feel. Mm-hmm. And CBG and CBN, all these, which we don't really you know we've isolated thc and mm-hmm. we all kind of know what okay that's you know but even that there's nuance the sativa and indica spectrum is huge you know so and then percentages and mm-hmm. and, and, and then when you're medicating oh my God, you know, a different molecule right like delta 8 delta 9 tca thcb thcb like yeah. you're absolutely right <laughs> right i mean um, it, it goes on um and then we're, 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 the interesting thing that we're finding you know, when we talk about cbd is that we're getting all these reports on these these new um, cannabinoids that are really affecting people's uh, medical benefits, I guess you could say, um, by, and it's not just CBD. Uh, so, you know, we, we have cancer patients doing one-to-ones, uh, like we said, CBN, uh, T, mm-hmm. you know, we, we, mm-hmm. we've touched on a bunch of them. They all have a different value and a reason, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what, what happens with legality, right? Yeah. Um, and, th- and that's the truth yeah. of CBD is recognizing that at the moment, the plant breeding landscape moves faster than the legislative landscape. Mm. We can literally just breed to what they say is allowed. And that's really how CBD came about. Mm. And that's a first kind of vanguard of essentially by wow. reading of any law that like every single compound is available other than the THC. Right. Which to the point that it becomes such an absurdity that as we're seeing already unfold, it's just a power grab. And it's more about like, okay, who owns patents? Who can we make have um, advantage mm. that's in the conventional um, economic. Well, like anything in this in this country or in this world, uh, nothing proceeds without a financial <laughs> uh, right. gain, right? I mean, these guys are looking for the money. I mean, I'm reading reports on billions and billions and billions of dollars, and now all these companies are, are just quickly shifting their idealistics just because of its it's it, the money aspect of it, not because of the health or the prohibition or the social right. issues that are surrounding cannabis. It's more like, hey, I can make it a couple billion dollars this year by yep. attaching myself to this company. Yeah. Um, we meet investors all the time, which is unfortunate, and I, and I hate saying this from our industry, but like, what really affects me here is when we go to like a knee can, right? And we see a lot of people running around that absolutely have love for this plant, right? They are really set their lives to this plant, have gone to jail for this plant, right? But right. under house arrest, who 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 have had life 
big life issues, right? Um, and then they're being supported by the guy that's in it for the five-year gain. You know what I mean? It's the yeah. company goes, hey, I just threw $20 million at this. I'll be out in three years. Yeah. Uh, it's a bubble, right? Um, is this bubble good or bad for this industry? Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's. <laughs> I think that's a great question. I think it's definitely the beginning yeah. of a big curve up, no matter how it's measured, really. Mm-hmm. But but how it's distributed, and you know, is it is it being distributed fairly? Is just oh, do we actually welcome it into the normal economy? Right, that's how it works. Right, and so that's I think that the right. real beauty of of cannabis, and and frankly the the, the value of um, the underground is this this on the one hand no transparency which i think we all need more transparency but on mm-hmm. the other hand like an intimacy that um you know we kind of um yeah we know who's who and what's what and um how this has moved for decades and where who where who bred which strains right and all mm-hmm. and all these people who are who are either in exile out of this country or still in prison is in total absurdity while we see this on Wall Street. It's it's just you know yep. we all need to really really work for like expungement and and more importantly than expungement is getting people who are still in bar in in, in in prison out. Right now, now speaking of that though, I mean, you know, this has been a long debate too. Like uh, sh- here here, it seems like every state's so far opposite every other state near it. You know what I mean? One state's allowing open open consumption, mushrooms, uh, they're, they're decriminalizing everything. In other states, you know, we're still going to jail for a plan over the count. You know what I mean? Um, should it be a federally governed thing uh, if we're going to get to be this big, big corporate thing, or should it just be still up to the state's hands? Yeah, How do you feel about that's it? That's a great question. I mean, and that's, that's I think, you saw also a deeper question about, like, as we work towards like states' rights, or even like the dissolution of the United States, which right. like if we were to look like in yeah. geologic time, it seems inevitable. And like there's, it's really great to study that, and it's really interesting because people study that, and then we start talking about like, oh well, what what about um, you know things like abortion, and how do we allow, how far do we let like regions to decide completely for themselves? I mean, I think that the civil rights movement would have gone differently if the federal government didn't get involved, and. I don't, I'm not a fan of the federal government generally, though. And I think it's really interesting to see these states willing to innovate. I mean, I think we were looking at how these huge empires in, 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 in history have devolved or evolved into smaller, more autonomous states. I think, I think that's inevitable for how we take control of our lives. I think it's necessary. But I cheer on certain people and I'm, I'm aggast at others <laughs> while, while we give more, you know, direct dramatic, democratic control, right? Now, yeah, I mean, man, um, you know, we're, there's so many different things to talk about now. And then the next biggest thing is, is the medical fields, right? Like, where 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 do we start with the medical field? I mean, you you are involved in so many different projects with universities, right? What was really fun? I also got to smoke weed in the MRI at UVM. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so now, now was that was that for testing purposes? Or it just... was. It was a part of a study, <laughs> and they had me inside of like a giant. Um, clear encasement like a like a sleeping beauty type glass hood that sucked all the smoke away and it was a joint that the guy lit like through a tuba slide really yeah from outside this cage so i dude i mean tell me if i'm wrong it seems like from the outside uvm has really taken a a, 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 a a big steps forward in into working with cannabis and studies right are we wrong I mean, we don't hear much about it. Like, no. what's going on behind I mean, so the scenes? So there's actually, it's, I don't know. You know, to be honest, I wish I had a clue what was up because there's so many people doing so many different things. But essentially, you know, there's, there's Stephanie and the, the medical field that's doing these certificates, which are totally pioneering and, you know, getting people out there. But meanwhile, from from with, to generalize, the university's pretty conservative and, like, has barely set toe into, like, acknowledging that there's any kind of interest for for students to learn about, like, the, the cannabis, recreational adult use cannabis industry. Like, they won't touch that with mm-hmm. a 10-foot pole. Even though I feel mm-hmm. like 10 years ago there was a little, like, how to grow indoor class that, like, blew up. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, but, the biggest class know, of the year. <laughs> they are. And, and, you know, Scott would be the guy to, to ask now because um, Scott and Heather are collaborating on a, at least an online course. I mm-hmm. think they will visit Willow Crossing with it. There's going to be a few in-person sessions. But essentially, it's hemp, mm-hmm. industrial hemp-tailored offering. Mm-hmm. 
um, which is mostly what we're seeing at the universities and mostly what, you know, uh, like federal uh, student aid and stuff like that is it's kind of they basically looked at 2018 federal hemp law to say okay we're going to allow student loans to use that because that was I think what happened with even you know in Oregon and some of these programs Oakland College that was mm. doing pioneering like cannabis growth and you know medical industry and caretaker industry like uh, hard skills training mm. um, with a pretty good quality too I mean basically anybody you know the more you study it the more you realize like oh ecology is what I'm participating in right mm. Um, so I think as long as you keep an open mind and you're not studying from someone who's selling you a certain product, which I think <laughs> a lot of, um, you know, but uh, like how do I get my buds bigger? That's what I'm here for. But you know, right? they faltered because students couldn't get loans um, mm. because the federal government was really tight with any kind of no none of that. So that's that's where it all comes back to the original question. I mean, it's like, yeah, I'd love to see us do it without the federal government, and we live in at the moment the United States of right. America, right? So until we really, you know, and that's the whole thing. Even when we talk about like Vermont secession, you know, it's like okay, let's put it put it in practice, and then it becomes in name only. I mean, we have mm. so much work to do to even even in the states where it is legal and it's great to see everybody pioneering in different directions but again i'm like not bummed that vermont didn't pass not that there's still people being prosecuted right that i I think we should be long past that but because we still haven't got it right we Mm. still haven't really gotten a bill that everybody was really excited about and 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 unfortunately i think you know part of what stalled this year's process was the the dispensaries yeah. Um, kind of throwing their weight in so 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 to, to so unfairly tip the scales. Mm-hmm. Uh, to be completely honest, yeah, I mean it was it was. It- I, I agree with you, man. I, I'm kind of glad it didn't happen. Uh, I wasn't a big fan of the bill. Um, I know there was a big. It, it did drop by the end, but they just couldn't get it together. Right. I mean, uh, you know, there, there, there's things that Vermont should go back and look at. I mean, we're starting to see other states with decriminalization, expungements, um, and, and really supporting the minorities and, and things of that nature and making sure that the small businesses get that start. And, you know, I mean, Massachusetts is working on micro-business licenses. Um, we had Ed D'Souza on last week, who is, is part of that program. Uh, he explained that quite a bit, which is which is really unique, because they're really trying to make sure that micro-businesses, small farms, um, the small right. farmers actually can get a, a foothold in the door. And in, in Mass, that's one of those states where we see, like, every dispensary get open, get bought out by a major a conglomerate, right? Yeah, um, and then we see the small guys who we we provided hemp starts to like panicked now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting right. it's an interesting business. Yeah, I mean, with those folks, do we have the date? That's today, right? This afternoon, in that's Boston. this afternoon in, in Mass. I think it starts yeah. at two o'clock. Um, so there there is hearings uh, on the whole CBD regulations and, and things like that in Massachusetts. If you guys are out there and you can get there, I believe it starts at two o'clock. There's a lot of great things on uh, on Facebook and on the social media where you can find stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, MCRR, MCCR is on there. Uh, we have a lot of different things. So you guys just, just quickly Google it. You'll find it. Um, but they did. Last week they said that, you know, no CBD in foods. Um, and they're trying to pull everything right. off the shelves. So um, as they're trying to establish these businesses and give these licenses out, they're also kind of taking it away. You know what I mean? Um, right. So now we have people with licenses in Massachusetts to for their edible companies that can't sell edibles. Uh, last week we had Mary Palmer on. She's, you know, she was, she's sitting there and waiting now because her whole business is derived off of consumable edible products, correct? Um, so hopefully, like in Maine, we'll see something switch really soon. Um, I think we went right into the show really quick, Keith. Uh, Sorry, we have a lot to talk about, in. man, right? <laughs> so, but let me, let me tell people who you are, where you're from, and how they can reach out to you. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm based in Willow Crossing Farm. Willow Crossing Farm, at the moment, holds a collaborative of people. So Northern Roots is in our greenhouse growing cuts. Um, we work with other local. It's really interesting to see, just even Lamoille County, Vermont, like this sprouting of cannabis upstart industries. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so anyway, we, we host a lot of different people, and that's part of why we offer these you know educational immersions. Is because the truth is, there's no one best way to grow cannabis. There's no there's no one best way to you know um, make our livelihoods. So when we bring in this all these different perspectives from nurseries, flower producers, folks doing light deprivation operations, and then of course you know in in like the residential course we host folks who are literally like the best growers I know in. In California and in, in in an unstated location indoors, uh, Don Gardon, or uh, you know, you've seen his flowers in the High Times magazines. Um, so these folks, we all come together, we all share notes. And I'm a big fan of that kind of open source and transparency, and like I don't believe in proprietary techniques or genetics. 
I think that, you know, we need to spread this out, but we need to have much more transparency. And I, I don't know if that needs to be regulatorily enforced, but we, as consumers, especially with to see all these people excited about CBD, you know, kind of waking up, like essentially the whole baby boomer generation is saying, oh, like diet, diet weed, like, okay, you know, right. <laughs> um, and it's, we, we, you know, it's great to, to, to be finding which compounds work best for our bodies mm. as long as we acknowledge we've only bred for two so far right. <laughs> and not one and a half you know now what do you think so, about these high thc levels i mean a yeah, lot of people are complaining I, about high thc levels I compared to 30 years ago that's some people's jam again it's transparency mm -hmm. so if that's what you're after and that's what you want you should have access to that but mm -hmm. if you're you know experimenting with your first use of cannabis and you accidentally ingest some form of concentrate that you know you don't you don't have the Mm. Gradient. I, I see why you know transparency. We need to know right. what it is, and that's that's why I don't have anything against you know like diamond sauce and isolates and THC things like that. But we need to we need to know. We can't have this this international trade commodity right. where uh, you know. And so I think consumers need to know the plants more. And it's so great to you know like people who who, who buy their first magic butter machine or learn how to use a crock pot. And that's mo the majority of people. You talk about the stats about who can or can't roll joints. Hmm. Like how many people make their own butter or coconut oil right. infusions. And then once you even those mm -hmm. two basic, like a coconut oil infusion, transdermally, internally, a little spoonful in your coffee or tea, mm. um, and you have this you know stomach ingested slow release cannabis that's totally different even if it was your favorite THC strain mm -hmm. or CBD strain or whatever so there's so many different ways of even just applying medicine right. that i really think more of us should be working with clinical herbalists you know like Rochelle Bacchus here in Vermont and Stephanie Boucher that's awesome um, welcome to Vermont <laughs> yeah um, so it, we all need if we don't have the skills and knowledge which we all of us are learning so mm. all of us have room to learn and we all need to do that better together mm -hmm. and and be more transparent and be more participatory and not just saying oh, this is my favorite pill or right. this is my favorite tincture but like oh well actually i really like an 80 proof grain alcohol better than like the high test yeah. or, or whatever well that's that that was like that was a perfect uh comparison i was going to make here i mean we, we talk about this cannabis um we talk about the higher levels but i mean there's a need for it but then again i look at beer like i can go buy a 13 percent beer at the store right do does it and need during to be the prohibition the bootleggers <laughs> weren't moving you know what we see most people choose these days right. because of the in illegal nature of smuggling right. they were concentrating <laughs> so it's really interesting and, and i think there's so many parallels i think there's un, un untrue parallels made between prohibition of alcohol um, mostly due to how long cannabis has been in prohibition and, uh, relative to alcohol and the reasons why mm -hmm. but it's really interesting most people don't know that like walgreens is a national pharmacy chain erupted from prescribed alcohol during prohibition mm -hmm. where it became a thing the wealthy man still had his whiskey that he just had to go to walgreens <laughs> for. to get it right <laughs> so, and it's really interesting how that parallels with dispensaries in in california and they're basically you know totally pioneering by 20 years now as we kind of wake up as a nation what was happening in california for for, tw for 20 years 23 years yeah, it's uh, it's crazy the parallels that you can that you can make with the the alcohol industry, um, yeah. guys. It is uh, eleven thirty. We're gonna take a quick break right here. If uh, my computer will cooperate with me, um, we're gonna go right to Brandon Barbario, our co-host, with his strain of the week, Zen Skywalker. Maybe. All right, technical difficulties. So hopefully that'll work here in a minute. Well, just to get just to finish that thread, it's it's great because we've explored the medicinal applications of cannabis, and there and there are so many and and so diverse, and also dangerous as potentially contrasted with the spiritual potential for legalization, which I think is even more profoundly the violation of our rights if we look at like what, what the united states is intended to hold as as values and we recognize that for most users really there is some form of spiritual aspect to their ingestion of cannabis mm. and and i think you know, i'm not trying to like clarify it into one you know name here we go oh there it goes hold on hold on hold on we'll finish your question there my, my computer just what? Had a brain fart, but um, you know, and I think that those are the legal implications too. As we see the synthesis of these compounds and the patenting of these compounds, like it, we're in danger of the way that we've done it, and we're very much in danger with the way that CBD is rolling out federally, as a as a as a as a as an industrial agricultural commodity. That's you know, Forbes magazine even just addressed the rush into CBD by the thousands of acres of these huge scale combine harvested mm -hmm. hemp operations. Mm -hmm. 
It's ridiculous. And when you get that big, like you said, you, you lose quality, you lose some control, right? I mean... Well, you're certainly not picking through every bud and making sure there's no, like, bugs or mold. Mold, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Which we see a lot, of, a lot of these issues with here. So, um, guys, I just want to do a quick uh, call here. You are tuning to WGDR Plainfield, WGDH Hardware. This is Guard College Community Radio uh, on 91.1 FM and 91.7. If you guys ever want to find us online, you can find us live streaming at www.wgdr.org and you can also reach out to us on facebook uh in the weeds uh in the weeds group page and we also have willow cross and farm and prospect rock permaculture now y- you've been battling with the facebook things right i mean you of all people who don't really advertise like major cannabis it's not like you're really just this morning we woke up to a notification about a hemp clone post that they've been actually asking us to promote like i think they just recently turned us back on from last summer where we were also suspended right um so it's really interesting because you know and that's something that's i don't know if tim's tim's still on the air um or you know listening but i really wonder if there isn't any potential for collective action on behalf of now federally legal hemp farmers uh, being subject to this literal censorship um so whatever, I'm not going to get like mad about Facebook. I kind of like hate it as a thing anyway. <laughs> but like it, they are, you know, they and and I get it, you know, because now just hit the news is like the horrendous trauma that the guys that view everything that gets flagged on Facebook have to go through, and these guys are watching like people abuse animals and worse, and you know, I feel for them too because it's essentially like a sweatshop operation. So. Um, how do we move past Facebook, right? How do we know our, know each other, know our neighbors? You know, I've met so many people in this virtual world that that it's cool. But uh, I come come to the farm and say hello. You know, look Shake me up, hand. send right. an email, <laughs> get get off of the, you know. And uh, I guess you know, I'd say like we're going to be more active on Instagram, but Instagram mm-hmm. is owned by Facebook. And well, that's the interesting thing. Know, it's you go to Instagram oh. and you see nothing but pictures and and and. And my website's a total Sales, joke, so you maybe? can go there and look at what we've been doing. <laughs> you can go to my website and look at what we've been doing for years past because it's hopelessly out of date. But, um, you know, we are, we are trying to figure that out. we got to step forward into the new media in a different way. We just had a group of uh, Champlain College students tell our story. That was really fun to have them make this little movie, and that, that centered on hemp in part. Um, it's, you know, we are just trying to bring a regenerative component to this it's we we i'm not no criticism against any particular farmers but even here in vermont to see these mass acreages in tillage and plastic mulch uh growing hemp is a little concerning because you know we we don't need to grow that volume to keep the value especially if we did more direct to consumer participation Mm -hmm. um and there's some folks that are doing it really well, and it's not why I can't criticize them is that's the standard practice of most organic farms growing vegetables as well. Right. So you know they're not doing anything worse than the best practice of farms that we also cheer from and are glad to choose from, as opposed to what's even worse than these. So, but again, it's like how do how do we you know certification, organic certification now eligible for hemp, is really important if you don't know your grower. Mm-hmm. If you know your grower and you know their space and you can walk their gardens, does it matter what certificates they hold? And if we could get to that place, especially, you know, with with everything we eat, that's that's my vision, mm-hmm. especially in a place like Vermont where that's actually possible. We have so many great growers around us and a lot of people think permaculture mm-hmm. is, you know, I'm going to grow all of my food. No, it's like how do we just weave this web with more intention? Right. So, if I if I am a carnivorous eater, if I am a meat eater, I want to see the pasture know the dude maybe have his name on the, on the tag and, you know and i'm sorry to say that to know them, but i hope right? i hope that hope that vegans and vegetarians would actually cheer us on in that vision of getting mm. animals out of cages you know i think there's a lot more room for solidarity in that because mm. I, i've been vegetarian i'm friends with a lot of vegans and vegetarians and this this strife because what i'm speaking to is the same thing when we get down to relationship which is really really what we're trying to say is like you know, and that's where it really comes down to is why being a nursery is so exciting because it's like the more plants we put in people's hands, let us grow at least. Right. Right. So every, everybody can grow their own. I encourage more people to do that, do that really well. And we try to put the tools in people's hands to do that. Right. I mean, and in most states, you're allowed to grow right now. Um, you know, in Vermont, we do have smaller plant counts in most, some other states. Well, but- Illinois just passed, and that seems to be like the next leg of corporate mm-hmm. legalization is is a marketplace without the ability to grow. Hmm. Let me ask you this question. In New York, you know, uh, through their spending bill, they they were talking about, you know, pushing uh, 
uh, legalization, right? Uh, adult use legalization. Now, within their adult use legalization, they were limiting or basically telling you you couldn't grow at home. Right. Do you think there should be any legalization without the ability to grow your own? I think everyone should be able to grow their own, and I think everyone should grow their own. I mean, you know, th give thanks to all these activists who stand with, like, one plant in the places where they know they're not allowed and, like, don't hide it. Because mm. we've, we've, uh, we, I've been that pioneer, and I, and I paid the price, and I had some privilege that protected me from how bad that price was. So it's all the more important, especially people facing, like, ridiculous decade-long sentences for anything related to cannabis. Like, we right. need to reiterate that. But that said, I mean, we should go, you know, grow... Um, our own, <laughs> whether we're allowed to or not, and that's I think where we really have the the the, the best argument for. There's no, there's, you know, the the law can hedge and moan about how they regulate a lot of things, but they can't tell us what we can and can't grow in our garden as plants. Hmm. Which is, which is, I mean, it's still ridiculous. Uh, we can have it legalized, but you can't grow it. You can be a patient of it, but you can't grow it, right? Um, and then, I mean, as we talked, there's so many different benefits beneficiaries to to cannabis not just as a health thing it's it's we're talking about industrial hemp just a little while ago right and industrial hemp does have promise it's really exciting you know to look at it um for fiber for plastics if we're going to be consuming these plastics and again is recognizing like okay this is a, a large-scale monoculture tillage based monoculture so mm. i'm not the biggest advocate of saying like hemp everywhere because but that said, I mean, we do have no fiber industry. It'd be really interesting, even just for our CBD, still has the promise to make hempcrete, still has the promise to make livestock bedding, still has the promise to make biofuels in terms of pellets. Mm. So even that, which, you know, the fiber and stalk of the CBD being bred for a Christmas tree of flowers isn't isn't the same. And, and it's, it's, again, where this whole CBD hemp thing becomes so confusing is because people use this legal definition of hemp to describe medicinal marijuana that we're growing for Cincinnati, yeah. right, which is which is the CBD. So anyway, those stocks are still of value, though, and it's scary, too, as a Cincinnati producer, like what happens when a hemp seed farm moves in next door or a hemp fiber farm moves in next door and they have monoecious plants which have male flowers making pollen all over hundreds of acres, potentially, especially in the Midwest. Right. So it's it's kind of, it's interesting, too, to see this CBD blow up in the places where that's more likely. Huh. Like I'm not very likely to have a you know, huge across uh, fiber, yeah. fiber operation show up where I am. But there are people actually, I've just heard news today about, you know, big, big purchases. It's re it's, you know, it's so dizzying. You can't, can't keep pace with the, with the legality, with the, with the state differentiations. And, and there's, there's a, there's so much to the story and depending on, you know, how we participate in our lawmaking systems mm -hmm. and, and where, how we define boundaries and borders and whether we take control of our lives. And so, you know, let's get ourselves, who have been cannabis users, out of prisons. Right. Let's get ourselves with good genetics in our gardens. Let's get ourselves with good growers who we know by name. Let's get ourselves with good places where our weed comes from, where our hemp comes from, where our food comes from, mm. and build relationships. Should, should people be worried uh, growing outdoors? I mean, we're seeing, like, these huge multi, multi, multi-acre farms coming in with hemp. Yeah. Um, should we be confused, concerned well, about cross-pollinations or, or runoffs or anything from these farms? I mean, so far, we are mostly growing CBD. Almost all of the hemp licenses in Vermont appear to be CBD. There is one operation in the Middlebury area growing seed that I'm aware of. Um so no, I don't think you know most of these are going to be very closely monitored in terms of male plants and sexing and elimination or growing from clones or feminized seeds. Um, and you know some people are doing it better than others. I'd love to see people uh, paying more attention to basic principles of soil conservation. I'd love to like we we we, we offer that for any hemp farmer that wants to like help figure out like how to improve their drainage and repairing buffers and like even just you know if they're still going to do tillage but transition to no till mm. or where they want to lay out like hedges and windbreaks for conservation of soil because that's you know I think one of our one of our most valuable commodities that we lose when we till is our topsoil and that's especially if we talk about trying to live in this part of the world without eating from california right. um, we really need to conserve our topsoils and conserve farmland from from development or unwise development like big you know i get it the dream you know the 10 acre house you want to you know have all no neighbors around you but 
um, what we really need to do is have a different model of development, which mm. serves big open spaces suitable for, for growing food. Like and Co-op natures, right? You know, it's just really interesting if we really want to think through, like, intergenerationally, we know that oil is, isn't going to be here for future generations. So how do we live in a world where we don't eat from California or de- irrigated desert? Um, how do we live in a world where our own communities are more resilient to a season of flooding or a season of drought in some other part of the world, which right now you know, affects our price a little bit, mm. but it's only going to get more difficult to come from further away. And we have so much diversity yet like to, 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 to play with. I mean, like even, you know, and when it comes to medicinal herbs, there's hundreds of species that we all could like be in better correlation with for our yeah. health. And not just cannabis. I mean, as a chef, I, you know, we look at things like ginger and turmeric. Exactly, the tonic, and, and, the tonic herbs. Cannabis oh, is a tonic herb, right? And when and, you get all those all those mixed together, yeah, it's, it's it's a great thing. I mean, that's where I think people, a lot of people, are, are skipping. Like you said, it's a CBD craze, man. It's a CBD craze. Everybody's just kind of like forgetting everything else. I mean, what's what's what I love about the the whole new cannabis revolution, I guess you could say, is is the fact that herbalists now are are, are making a strong comeback, right? Yeah, like for years we used to think they were witches, right? I mean, that was the thing back in the day. We used to think yeah. that they were talking to plants. We used to think there was something weird about it, right? But now we're realizing that man, these guys had it right the whole time, right? Yeah, I mean, that and that's I think, oh, yeah. you know, even even part of the the quote-unquote racist history of the word marijuana. I understand how it was used as a, a tool to play on people's racism and why people people recommend we don't use it. But actually, every time I hear it, I'm like, here we are honoring the traditions of these people that maintained the sacred and and um, and herbal use of what what was really brought by Europeans here for fiber, for flat, for you know, for um, sails and ropes, mm-hmm. and uh, essentially um, slaves. Mexicans, Indians mm-hmm. are the people who kept medicinal herbalism of these plants and kept these traditions alive, and, and I think we need to honor that. And, and if, if we could do that in the phrase of marijuana, you know, which is also some weird, you know, Christian imposition on Spanish, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's, it's, it's a, that's an interesting conversation. Right. When everybody asks, so, it's like when they see the marijuana with the H, it's like, did they spell this wrong? Well, no, that was actually uh, terms that were greatly used, right? Well, it's even it's, in the med- right. new, even with medicines, right? And it's a part of, it's a part of, it's also, it's not only holding our racism, it's also holding um, the um, the missionaries, you know, the, the, the destruction of Native peoples by the imposition of European mm-hmm. religions, right? I mean, that's, a, we really need to recognize, like, what, um, where we live, right? And so we, we, maybe we call this decolonizing cannabis, right, where we, where we recognize that it, it it's, <laughs> the economic interests aren't, aren't, um, in the best service of the sacred history of this plant Mm -hmm. and and how do we all if we want to use it like and and you know not say that we shouldn't um have the right livelihood with it either Mm -hmm. but how if if we're going to change right do we change cannabis to fit in our existing economic system or can we maybe like hold on to a plant that keeps us tapped to the power of healing plants, all of them, mm-hmm. and keeps us tapped to a participatory economy that happens in smaller circles mm-hmm. rather than an extractive model. Right. Where, where they just try to capitalize on that, right? Uh, co-ops, man. Great. Hey, great conversation here, guys. We do got to take a quick break. We, I think we got our technical difficulties worked out, so we're going to go to uh, Brendan Barbera with our stream of the week, guys. Do not go anywhere. You are tuned into WGDR Plainfield, WGDH Hardwick. This is Gar College Community Radio, 91.1 FM and 91.7. I'm Stephanie. Hi. I'm Brandon Barberia, your cannabis expert for In the Weeds, Prohibition Talk Radio on WGDR. This week's strain of the week is the Zen Skywalker OG. The Zen Skywalker OG is a 100% indica hybrid. This strain was actually created of a potent cross of the blueberry and the Mazzy Star strains. This dank bud boasts a moderate 20% THC rating, and it has a wonderful indica-type effect. Users describe the Zen as being overwhelming for new users, but slowly it will build and creep up on you, leaving you a little bit lethargic and completely couch-locked. 
almost out of nowhere, you will be completely spacey with a deep imperception of thought. However, this blissfulness will leave you with a pain-free type sleep. Due to these potent effects, it says that the Zen is great for treating things such as illness with tensions and muscle spasms and sleep disorders for insomnia and night terrors. This bud has a delicious aroma and sweet berries and herbs and taste of vanilla with a hint of herbal berry tea. The Zen Skywalker OG's buds are dense and fluffy with medium-sized mint cream popcorn-shaped nugs and orange hairs with a fine cover of crystals. Once again, I'm Brandon Barbario, your cannabis expert for In the Weeds Prohibition Talk Radio on WGDI. All right, guys, we are back. Thank you, Brandon Barbario, for that great stream of the week. Um, guys, I just got to give a, a quick announcement here. Um, as you guys all know, we are part of Gar College Community Radio here at WGDR. Um, and like many small public stations around the country, WGDR's federal and college funding has ended. The station's vitality is now in the hands of you, its listeners. Uh, and you guys can please join us on air and online between Monday, June 17th and Monday, June 24th, as WGDR is campaigning to raise money towards... Our continuation. Uh, if you guys want to find out more information about that, you can go to www.wgdr.org. And uh, if you guys want to support the show, the program, anything like that, just reach out to us, uh, and we need your support. Um, Big up WGDR, all the shows, all the DJs. It's it's. We try to tune in, even from Johnson and Jeffersonville over the mountain, and uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, it's, we, we have some really awesome programming here that you just can't find on, on many other stations, and including this one, right? I mean, we are one of the first and only all-campus talk shows on air, uh, so it's uh, it's an interesting thing. Oh. Yeah, let me just say you, y'all, all of you. My name's Stephanie. I do the show in 10 or plus minutes or whatever, personal and political. Anyway, feedback. I think y'all have the be- one of the best shows on right now. Thank you. We appreciate uh, that. Topics. You are. I, I'm hearing buzz about you up in Hardwick. People talk, talk about listening to you. They talk about learning things from you. So where else are you going to hear this show but on WGDR and WGDH? So make a donation. Go online. WGDR.org. There you go. Guys, you can't be here without your support, which is the unfortunate thing. Um, because, again, federal guidelines do not allow us to participate in a show like this on Federal airways. Um, we'll just put that out there, guys. So if you guys don't understand, as we talk about the federal federal restrictions and stuff like that, it directly affects us here in radio as well um, to provide our mm-hmm. listeners with the education and the information that we strive to do every week. Uh, thank you very much, Steph. I appreciate that shout-out. Uh, guys, and like I said, if you guys want to reach out to us, questions, concerns, comments, you can reach out to any one of our guests that are always on our show. You can reach out to me to find out how to reach out to them, or you can reach out them to them directly. Uh, Keith Morris of... Everything, right? You're everywhere. Yellow Crossing Farm. You're everything. Just, uh, you know, shoot me an email. I'll try to write you back. Or, you know, Uh, the farm is uh, open by appointment. So don't, we prefer people not to just show up, drive down the road. But but we are easily found. We're right right at the intersection of the Long Trail and Mm. the Moyle River. So you can hike or bike or walk or. It's a beautiful farm. You know, take a canoe. Right. And Um, if you guys want to meet your grower. Prime, prime time. Yeah, right? we really do encourage and invite people to walk through the CBD gardens, especially those of us, you know, those those who, who are making products out of raw flowers and, and want to, you know, kind of know their source. Uh, we really we want their, that transparency. We want that relationship. We actually have a sort of, um, a, uh, you know, we'll be having more events soon. Right now, the next things are uh, just the two week residential course, but during that, we'll have a bunch of open nights of film screenings mm-hmm. and uh, like guest presenters who are coming from out of the area sharing really cool stuff they're doing. So that's a week of July 22nd, July 21st through August 2nd. Mm. And that class also has full scholarships. So we're actually kind of, we got Ooh. four more spaces open, full scholarships for Vermont residents who can show uh, their, they have to, you, know, have to, you have to show your tax returns to VSAC, mm. but they'll, they'll basically, you know, uh, support uh, you in, relative to your income. Some people get 50% scholarships. Most people get 100% scholarship. So uh, definitely mm. encourage people to take advantage of that. And come study, you know, how this all lays out. Basically, it's a course around, like, livelihood design in terms of, 
and also learning like all the tree crops and natural building techniques unique mm. to this place and how we make maps and study the sun and wind and all the things that we should take into account whether we're actually growing or just participating with the people who grow mm. um, and or you know if we're anywhere in the added value chain from preparing food to preparing edibles to um, you know performing music and that's you know we're a big fan of the arts we have a stage if anybody's got like a musical they're, they're putting on they can't find a venue or, or a ballet performance or like we love aerialists and and you know flow arts and things like that so we, we always have a venue that's a cannabis friendly venue um, we have an incredible kitchen mm -hmm. it's it's a rustic outdoor kitchen but there's an earth oven and there's a dining space that's protected from the weather and we'd, we'd love to collaborate with more people we, we're not sure what's coming next we, we are working with some musicians it looks like the biggest project that we were going to do this year is pushed to 2020 mm -hmm. um, but uh yeah the stage is there there's some things cooking um and the whole place is solar powered too that's our most recent thing we, we spent some time just crawling wow. around the roof we ended up figuring out how to plug it in you know ourselves or just kind of basically followed the direction book right. <laughs> you know? but ended up with like, what happens when you do that right top of the line like high-end solar for like a fraction of what the solar company was gonna yeah well i've seen you talking about this and this is another interesting conversation because i mean as we look at our power grid issues especially in vermont yeah. as people are starting to turn on their lights man this yeah. is going to cause another string of issues yeah. that no one's even talking about right it's, it's pretty easy i'm happy to help I'm, I'm not a solar professional and that might show you how potentially easy it is i mean you could easily basically you're looking at a dollar a watt last mm. i checked and i'm not the most up to date but mm -hmm. i'd say in terms of parts mm. so if you think about that you know like a five a 5500 uh, watt array mm. cost me about five thousand bucks in parts and this is what you know some common quoted 35 grand for mm -hmm. um so to give you a sense of like the markup in that from parts to installation. installation right and that's including the roof racking and all the microinverters like every champ panels on a wi-fi signal and i can look at it and you know the so you're, you're able to buy all that stuff for a dollar a watt a dollar a watt that's and, awesome. and you know and then you gotta you gotta work with the state to hook it up mm -hmm. and that's you know it's actually potentially easily done off grid too if you want to just not even tie into the grid but most systems and if you want like the tax breaks and stuff like that mm -hmm. you're going to tie into your utility and that's changing radically it's getting mm -hmm. less and less friendly every year as mm -hmm. far as like what rates they they buy but you know you can still do it it's just less um you know, it's it's getting they they the, the utilities are. I can't speak for them. It's, I'm, again, I'm not, solar industry isn't isn't my expertise. But to answer the question, can you offset what you consume as a cannabis producer very easily and inexpensively? And it's a great long term investment. Mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. said, there's a lot of nuance in terms of like grid tie. But basically, July 1st is when the next one changes. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to do grid tie, like do it this week. No. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right now, right in, in Vermont. So statewide Vermont uh, solar incentives change July 1st. So you know, go go to uh, Green Mountain Electric, like wholesaler, and they'll design and quote you the whole mm. system and then you can figure out how to put it back together later right. and, and it can support and it can support grows i mean there's there's power there it's power available all right guys that's about it for our show today we're going to end our show t with uh our resident our and jesselyn dolan with her health and wellness tips it is again guys it is our fundraising week here at gdr so please stay tuned uh be positive send us some good vibes and and you know send us some money uh keep us flowing keep us here uh if you guys want to underwrite the show guys you can always underwrite any of our shows here on our any of our from any of our uh you know Program. shows programmers there we go <laughs> uh very easily. So just reach out to the station. Uh, you can contact Chris Gruen at WGDR, and uh, he can help assist you in all that. Uh, guys, but that's it. We're going to head out. Uh, we'll see you next week. One big thing is is we're moving again, guys. The station has moved us yet once again. We're going to go to Fridays at from 12 to 2, so we're going to get our syndication going here. So hopefully pretty soon, guys, you'll be hearing us on well over 100 channels of syndication. That's our goal. Uh, but we need your help, so stay tuned, stay focused, keep supporting the station and in the weeds. And Keith? Friday 10 to 2. As of this Friday? Uh, next Friday. Okay. So, so I look forward to tuning noon, in. Noon to 2. Noon, uh, yeah, sorry. Noon to 2. Noon to 2. Sorry. Noon to 2. Yeah. Um, so... Our biggest our biggest hurdle to get syndicated was a two hour block. I refused to to reduce the show down to an hour because there's just too much good information here. I don't want to cut anybody out. You know, you're um, going to find two hours is not enough either. Well, an hour and a half definitely no. isn't either. Oh, so. no, I'm completely. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
So, all right, guys. Well, we're gonna set this off. We'll yeah. talk to you a week from Friday. I right? just want to thanks for thank you for having me. Thank you for your show. It's great. We try to we try to tune in, uh, especially the, in the weeds and all the GDR. Thanks for everybody for throwing in. It looks like the community's already raised twenty five thousand bucks, which is amazing. But right. there's another fifteen grand to go. So throw into WGDR. Um, I'll also just let you know you can find me and my updated website and programs at uh, <laughs> www.prospectrock. Dot org or willowcrossing.org. Mm. And um, the July permaculture course, July 21st to August 2nd, includes three all farm sourced meals every day. And you get to live, you know, on the river through the summer. And then we're also going to have a regenerative cannabis course, mm. which is. Oh my gosh, in, in Johnson. That one's actually filling up already. That one's almost full um, out this far out. So that's exciting. We're going to be talking about best practice for organic production, propagation, processing. Uh, we're going to be working with chefs and add value. Jesse Lynn will be mm. with us um, sharing some of the, the, the Canon nurses world. We're going to work with folks who are working in fiber, working in seeds, kind of cover the whole spectrum. Also, of course, adult use, mm. recreational cannabis. Um, so it's really exciting. We're going to have growers from all over the country join us sharing secrets and, um, can, I, can I come? Cutting plants. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, in fact, you're you're a guest. I think you're going to be, be a guest chef for one of the uh, meals. I'm trying. I'm trying so. to. Ni- I'm trying to nail this down for them. Yeah, she, yeah. We were asked about that. So. So yeah, that's just prospectrock.org. And you know, if you want to learn how to grow, or if you want to learn how to build natural buildings, or if you want to learn about tree crops, you know, just come by. Um, we also have a nursery. Um, there's a lot of great nurseries around here in the Plainfield area. I guess it's worth shouting out Buzz Fervor and Nico Rubin. Amazing. If you're interested guys. in nut yep. trees, I think, you know, Buzz is definitely into hemp too. So, uh, for the local listeners. Um, but thanks so much for having me. Well, thank Keith. Thank you, man. I mean, without, without guys like you, our job is going to be impossible. You're, you're directly affecting the community. You're, you're in the state house. You're advocating. And all I can do is give you a big hats off. And you're welcome on the show anytime you ever want to be on. Um, anything we can do to support you, man, um, and you're intensive. So These classes that you provide are awesome, guys. So seriously, go check them out. Um, there's yeah. there's more than you can ever imagine and learn. It's, it's it's like going to Boy Scout camp all over again, right? But based, based on the farm yeah, and cannabis, right? With a, with a bow draw. <laughs>